Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our webinar on how to unlock your selling potential. Delighted to welcome Chad Rubin today. Uh, he is renowned in e-commerce circles for knowing exactly how to go from zero to bestseller. So uh, my name is Lisa Byrne. I'm an e-commerce support specialist here at Excelco. Uh, so I was once an online seller myself. So I do understand many of the challenges that you all face, uh, especially when you're trying to scale your business um, with choosing the right product and managing your international customer support. So just recently, to give you an overview, Skubana and Excelco joined forces to integrate our product offering. Um, so our product, Excelco Fusion, is a customer support help desk, which is tailored specifically towards uh, online sellers. And Skubana, which uh, streamlines your operations uh, and your inventory. So the aim is that with our powers combined, uh, we'll be able to help online sellers take your business to the next level. Um, so. <clears throat> Throughout the webinar, we'd love to make it really interactive. So if anyone has any questions at all, just pop them in the chat box on the app there, and myself and Chad will try to answer them throughout the presentation. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Chad. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I know you could be doing a lot of other things today, and you chose to join the presentation, so it's my job to make sure that everyone extracts a tremendous amount of value from this presentation. So I want to make this interactive. If you have questions, put it in the chat box. We'll do about 45 minutes. Uh, if, it's, if we make it more interactive, we could go a little bit over. I do want to tell you that I am going to be sharing something special with you at the end of this presentation. It's my first real webinar doing this all by myself and presenting this material. So be on the lookout for what I'm going to share with you at the end. So let's move right into it here. And my PowerPoint. Oh, there we go. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I started off on Wall Street uh, doing equity research on internet stocks. My parents had a vacuum store that was going out of business, and I took their product and started selling it online. This was a decade ago before private labeling was really the sexy in thing to do. Uh, there was not a lot of competition. I decided to go direct to consumer. At, in 2009, I went direct to consumer. I built a very large eight-figure business. and uh, started a software to solve the problems that I was facing. So I like to share, I'm all about education and sharing what I've learned to make sure that people don't lose money, time, and certainly hair loss. And I've learned, lost a lot of that. Uh, and so I, I feel an enormous kinship to the people that are joining us today because I, I've been where you are at and I want to help you take your business to the next level. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So first thing is why are we here? There's a lot of different people on this on this webinar today. Some people have no e-commerce idea what they want to do. Some people have a great idea and they don't know how to execute it. And some people have eight-figure businesses. Some of them are Scubana customers or Excelco customers. So hopefully you can leave with some golden gems from this presentation and you can implement into your business. Again, that's what I'm going to do. My job is to drop tremendous value as much as I can. So it's a very simple three-step process I'm going to take everybody through. It's all about private labeling and building your own brand. The first is how do you come across, uh, how do you discover what you want to manufacture? The next is how do you validate the idea to take out the guesswork? And then of course the next piece is execution. There's a lot of stuff we need to go through. So the first thing is you want to find a product that bother, or a problem that really bothers you. We walk around in life and we have these aha moments where we are like, wow, that really irks me or that really bothers me or pisses me off. So you want to find a problem before creating the idea. And what I'm finding right now in the Amazon world is that a lot of Amazon sellers just go online and decide that they want to manufacture the next uh, spatula or garlic press. And so we're trying to change the way, the environment is changing dramatically. Like Amazon has already 500 garlic presses. There's not another one that's needed on Amazon today. So we want, to, we want to sell a solution to a problem, not, not sell a product. So you look at the, your life around you. For me, I'm really into CrossFit. And so I have to ask myself, why, do, why does CrossFit apparel, why is it so expensive? It doesn't have to be this way. Why does gum, here's another example, simply gum. Why does gum have to have 25 ingredients while well, simply gum came out with a gum that has six ingredients? And then on top of that, with Scubana, I ask myself, why do we need to duct tape different softwares together to run your business? And why does it have to be so expensive? 
and why does it not have to be on the cloud? So you have to find problems first before you create the idea. So a freebie, right, one that I'm not moving into, is the iPhone 7, right? Everyone's complaining that the iPhone 7 doesn't have an audio jack anymore. So that's a problem. Why not create some sort of adapter or a headphone that actually fits into the lightning port on the iPhone 7? But you have to trust your crazy idea. A lot of people, there's a lot of haters out there. There's a lot of people that are peanut butter and jealous. You need to know that you're going to succeed. And this is part of the, part of the process. But the next piece here is the holy grail at the bottom. If you're going to get anything off this slide, is that you need to make sure that you're solving a problem, but you're doing it better, cheaper, and faster than others, and you're going direct to consumer. So we're going to go through four case studies today. Uh, Bonobos, which manufactures pants, and they've also added a lot more SKUs. Warby Parker, Dollar Shave Club, and Crucial. Crucial Vacuum is my business that's online. And all these companies have the same thing in common, is that they all go direct to consumer. And they all solve a problem. These are just examples. So the first company let's go through is Bonobos. And it was started by guys that have larger thighs, just like myself. They were lacrosse players. And pants were just never fitting well. So they came out and they said, we're going to solve the problem of better fitting pants. And if you go to their site, they do it better, they do it faster with uh, free returns, uh, two-day shipping, uh, they make it easier, they have ninjas online to answer all your questions, and they go direct to consumer. But the one piece that you can see it's crossed out on this slide is they don't do it cheaper. So for me, in my mind, I'm thinking ding, 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 okay, there's an opportunity here to actually make a pant that's better fitting, but do it for 99% of the population, not 1% of the population. Most importantly, they're going direct to consumer as close to the factory as they can get and as close to the consumer they can get. That's where you want to be. You want to cut out the people that are directly in the middle because it erodes your margin. The next is Warby Parker. Uh, I can't see a show of hands of how many people have heard of this company, but they're worth over a billion dollars. And this is a legacy company, uh, or not legacy, they've disrupted a legacy industry Luxottica has traditionally owned this market for a very long time, and they came in and they made a better product. Uh, they do it faster. They have free, free home try-ons. Uh, they certainly are much cheaper, $99 for glasses with prescription and direct-to-consumer. On top of that, they have a social mission, and that's just like a cherry on top. So that's Warby. Dollar Shave Club, just acquired by uh, Unilever. So... They're going after a very large market, and they're making blades at a cheaper price, and they're taking the thinking out of it. They deliver you your blades to your door, and you know you have to shave. So why go to CVS or go to any other uh, place to buy your blades? You can get them delivered, and then you just shave. And they do it far cheaper. They launched with a guerrilla marketing tactic, uh, which is video that really put them on the map. And at the time of acquisition, some people said they had about 10 to 15% of the market. And at the time that they were acquired, it's interesting, Gillette actually was suing them. That was the only way that they can compete with this company, was to actually just go after, go, do a lawsuit. Because they already lost. And so they were trying to see how they can catch up and slow down Dollar Shave Club, and it just didn't happen. So it's a very large market. They went after Warby Parker, went after a large market. Bonobos, like we all have to wear pants. We all have to shave. We all wear, a lot of us wear glasses. So for Crucial, I did the same thing uh, in 2009 with my own business. I saw there was a problem and decided to solve for that problem by making my own vacuum filters, uh, which became Crucial Vacuum. And so we have a direct consumer approach, uh, free shipping, free returns. So I try to increase my conversions by making sure that people trust the site that they're landing on. You'll see that there's a live chat box right at the bottom right-hand corner. 80% of our filters are washable and reusable. So that's we're solving a problem right away with that because most of the OEM filters are not washable or reusable. And then we have a social uh, consciousness about our company where we plant a tree for every 1,000 filters that are sold. This is the benefits of Crucial versus traditional vacuum brands. And you can see on the left with this graph, 
that we are passing on savings to the consumer, so we're lowering the price a lot, but we're still making nice profit margins, and we're passing on savings to the consumer to create a, a moat around our industry uh, to make sure that others don't really want to get into the vacuum space. So for me, it's about translating the same success we've had into other verticals. So you've got the Crucial Vacuum, which was vacuum filters. You've got coffee filters with, with uh, Crucial Coffee. With Crucial Air, we have air purification filters. And Think Crucial is all these other filters that don't fit into those micro brands. One of the interesting gems I can provide to you today is that 10 years ago, I thought it was going to be six years to disrupt the vacuum space. And it, and it was, but I picked a very myopic brand. Crucial Vacuum, where really tied me into not allowing me to expand into other channels. Because I thought that it was going to take me a long time to disrupt the vacuum space. It only took me six months to a year. So make sure when you're picking a brand, if you don't already have one, that you make it broad, where it allows you to give you flexibility. Because right now, we're in a rapidly changing environment. We are living through the biggest shift since the first mall was created in 19... There's a lot of things that are happening right now, and things are moving very rapidly. Like when I first started Crucial, that like private labeling wasn't even on the map. Now you launch a product, and there's an Amazon product death cycle that happens, where literally you have six months to make a lot of money until others invade into the space. So you have to be nimble in this environment. You have to move quick. You got to make sure you're picking a brand that allows you to go to be flexible across a lot of different verticals. Take what you know and what you're passionate about and move it into other verticals. Like I was never passionate about vacuum filters, but I love coffee. I'm still, I'm actually drinking coffee right now. So make sure you go after what you, what you uh, are passionate about. Again, crucial coffee. So uh, do, let's start there and see if anybody has questions. I want this to be interactive. Uh, and then we'll move into the next part of the presentation. Uh, actually, Chad, I have one question from, um uh, sorry, now skip the name. From Marta, uh, she's asking, what are the three barriers do online sellers typically face when scaling their business? What are the three typical errors? Barriers that uh, online sellers typically face whenever they're scaling their business. Uh, I would say the first, the first piece of that is an operational foundation. So make sure that you are actually building a business that can scale over time. So make sure you put in processes in place. I think the next, the next issue I think people face is they go after, they copy other products that are already doing well on Amazon. And I don't think that's the way to win in today's environment. Uh, and then uh, I think that's two, where you're copying. But also I think the other piece is that you're not solving, which is what we just discussed. You got to make sure you're solving a problem. And I'll go through kind of my mentality. The one gem I can mention right now is the fact that if you look at products that are doing well, everyone cares about how many reviews they have on Amazon, but nobody is paying attention of the customer narrative. What are the negatives that people are saying? And I love hip hop, so you gotta do what Biggie Smalls once said, which is take the negative and turn it into a positive. And so take those negatives and iterate them on them in your own product as you make a better product. Now, there's some people out there that are like, hey, Chad, you didn't create the vacuum filter. And that's absolutely correct. And Warby Parker didn't create the, the, the first eyeglass, right? We are not, uh, we're, we're essentially not trying to recreate the wheel here. We're iterating on it and creating better hubcaps on that car. We're modifying the car to make it better to enhance it. We're making the process better. That's what we're doing today. And so you can see, um, I actually have a shout out to two of Scubana's customers on this list, which is Cotopaxi and Deathwish. Here's more examples of people that are actually disrupting their industries in their current form. So you look at Casper. They're taking mattresses and selling, they solve the problem, which is better mattresses, delivering it direct to your home, and they offer a guarantee, and it's all on the internet. And they've really perfected the mattress, Cotopaxi. They are like REI, direct to consumer. You literally can buy their products, and it's awesome colors, the quality is great, and you can get it for half the cost. Harry's is shaving blades, and Death Wish Coffee is the world's strongest coffee. So you need to make sure, if you want to disrupt an industry, you beat them at their own game. You take these stale, legacy verticals that are not moving, 
there's no movement to them, and you're trying to do it better, make the process better. So at the bottom, you can see, here's another company I love, Everlane, and you can see how they do it. They literally cut out the middleman, they, they're very transparent with their costs, and go direct to consumer. And that's really the sweet spot, the holy grail of where you want to be. So here's, to wrap it up, is first you want to find the problem before you create an idea. You want to make sure you do it better, faster, cheaper, easier, and direct to consumer. And you want to go after these static, slow-moving verticals that don't move quickly. They have no connection to their customer. So they don't do any social media advertising. And they're also scared about channel conflict. These are companies that aren't nimble to move quickly to go direct to consumer. On top of that, we're really not, we're not trying to create the next Twitter. We're not trying to create the next Facebook. We're going after low-hanging fruit and going after what you know. So for me, I went after coffee because I knew it. I went after a vacuum product because I grew up in the vacuum space. I sold my first vacuum when I was 12 years old. So we're going after base hits. You want to you get on base at this point, and you want to just take one product at a time. This is the recipe for success from this section of the presentation. All right. So the next piece, so we've discovered a product, or you, got, you may be thinking about discovering a product. The next piece is really validating the product. So I use three different tools. Um, I use Amazon, I use eBay, and I use Google to make sure I take as much of the risk out of the equation. The biggest mistake you can make right now when you have a product idea is guessing. You do not want to guess. So let's get right into it. The first piece is Amazon. Now, Amazon is a near monopoly. 60% of all online transactions are happening with Amazon. 40% of product searches start on Amazon, and I'm almost going to guarantee you that a lot of them end on Amazon as well. So 40% up front, that's why Amazon's important. But Amazon is like a uh, massive database for you to discover and find what's going on. Like my wife might go to a yoga retreat and she'll come back, it's in the middle of the night, and she'll be, be like, hey, babe, what are you doing up so late? Why are you on the computer? With Listen, I'm on Amazon. I'm doing research. I'm reading what's happening. And I'm not using any tools. A lot of people are using all the same tools. And I don't believe that's the way to win. You can't win if you're using all these product research tools that everyone else is using. So I use Amazon, and I do my own qualitative research. So I go into Amazon.com. I'll type in coffee, and I'll pick a category, which allows you to actually search in the right-hand corner. And you can sort by uh, feature. It used to be new and popular. I think Amazon probably was on to me that I was doing this. But you sort by featured, and you can now start reading what's happening in, in the space. Like pick a vertical that's interesting to you, whether it's yoga or whether it's toothbrushes, and start reading reviews. I read, read, read reviews, and that's one of the best benefits of Amazon is reading reviews. On top of that, the review, the best selling rank right on the on the page. Now they'll show you a few different ranks. They'll show you where they are in the overall category, and they'll show you what, where you are in the subcategory. So I like to actually go into subcategories. Why? Is because they're niches. I want to get into the niche of a niche because everybody is looking at the broad categories. You need to make sure you become specialized in what you do and get into a space that is extremely niche, that's going to be as least competitive as possible. So here is one of the best-selling coffee presses on Amazon. Most people have never even heard of this thing. It looks like a surgical something from a hospital. And the issue with this product, for me, was the fact that it had uh, filters that were white, and people were complaining online that they were bleached filters. And I thought, wait, why don't we make a reusable filter for this unit and sell it? And that's what we started doing. And so you can see for this product here, uh, Amazon's giving you the best selling rank, like I described earlier, and where they rank in the subcategories and in the overall kitchen and dining category. Uh, and so we made a filter that fits, and now it just so happens that Amazon's now buying that product direct from it. But this is just one example of something that you can be solving for that, that didn't exist on the market when I created it. So that's Amazon. Do we have any questions on Amazon before we move into eBay? We actually have a question from Joe who's uh, wondering what your thoughts are on uh, fulfillment by Amazon. 
So if, if you're not doing fulfillment by Amazon, you're not even relevant. One of the, if you actually search a product right now, and on the left-hand side of Amazon, there's an area that says that lets you sort by crime. The most used part of that page on Amazon, like if you did a heat map, you'd see that everyone's going to Prime because people have zero tolerance for lawn shipping, and they've already paid for Prime. So you need to make sure your product is Prime right away. When you create a product, you make sure you get it to FBA immediately because that's part of actually getting ranked on Amazon. Part of the search algorithm, one of it, is actually, is your product FBA? Because they can guarantee that they're going to offer amazing service to their customers and offer two-day shipping. People go to Amazon for convenience, selection, and price. And Prime is one piece of that, which is convenience. And they will prioritize your product over others if you're FBA. Great. Uh, I have one other one from, uh, I think, a different Joe. Um, so he's wondering uh, how to find a trustworthy manufacturer for your products um, just to get it at a good price. I think he's scared that Amazon is going to be uh, uh, your competition. Well, Amazon's everyone's competition, right? Amazon has their own private label program that they've launched. And again, they're going after, they call it Amazon Basic. So they're going after basic items. But if you're launching a product that's innovative or unique or is differentiated, it's a wide open space for you to get involved in. So back to the initial question that Joe asked, the question was, how do I make sure my manufacturer is legit? And A, we, we're going to cover this in a, net, in a couple of slides coming, but just to answer very specifically, you have to make sure that you are asking as many questions to your supplier as possible. So, and you find a lot of suppliers, you want redundancy. So you're looking at, I'll give you the three things to look at. You're looking at lead time, you're looking at price and you're looking at quality. You want to make sure you ask for samples from the manufacturer and don't just ask for one because anyone can make a, a good cell phone case, but if you order 10, you'll see if there's anything defective about it, which gives you a wider sample size. So price, lead time, and quality are the three things to be analyzing of your, of your and there's a lot more I can go into, but I'll just, it's coming, it's coming guys. So any other questions before we move into eBay for validating your idea? Um, see. I think that's all the questions on Amazon for the moment. Um, there's one from uh, Medicus. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Um, but it, uh, he is wondering, is it worth using Amazon ads? Um, if so, how much should you spend on this? Oh, sorry, it's from So, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, firstly, Amazon ads are great. This goes back to Amazon's algorithm. So it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. For Amazon, what is most important is compelling content. They want to make sure that you're going to buy, whereas Google, it's actually unique content. So when you drive people to your page, there's a lot of on-page optimization you need, to have, you need to have, but it's a good way to drive more people to your page. And the more people that come to your page, which is sessions, the more people that buy your product, you're going to get pushed up the algorithm on Amazon. So yes, I highly suggest you do sponsored ads with Amazon. In terms of budget, it really depends on what you're selling and what your profit margin is. Highly suggest it, but you need to make sure you nail your Amazon listing. You need to make sure it's completely optimized, because if you send traffic and people don't buy, you're sending a signal to Amazon being like, eh, this page, this product doesn't do well, let's actually rank it lower and lower and lower on the search, on Amazon search. All right, let me move, let me move into eBay. I'm sure we'll have some more questions coming in. So I use Amazon as my primary source to figure out whether or not I should move into a product or a category. And that's a great place to start. But I believe a lot of people still go on eBay, believe it or not. And I use a software. I have nothing to do with the software. So this is just me, me saying I use it, uh, a company called Terapeak. And I do research and I can see what people are buying on eBay for competitors. It's fantastic. So I can put in an eBay competitor name or something I'm doing research on. Now I can see all the units that they sold for a certain time period. So I like to change the time period to 30 days. So you can see here, here's an example. You can pick a category. Let's just do that first. You pick a category, vacuums. And the interesting thing is that the things that are selling on eBay are different from the things that are selling on Amazon. It's actually a completely different customer. So this is just part of my idea of validating the idea. So people are buying vacuums, yes. What are they buying? Okay, they're buying these vacuums and they're very different from Amazon. So it gives me another viewpoint on uh, what else, what, other, what are people buying off of Amazon? 
On top of that, let me, let me click, you can also dive deeper into a competitor and you can see what they're selling, how many units are sold. Again, I like to sort this by 30 days. And that gives you a good, 30 days is a really good sample size and gives you an idea of what people are selling uh, or what this competitor is selling. Or even if it's not a competitor, you're just looking into CrossFit shorts. What are they selling? How are they doing? So that's eBay. And then the last piece, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have Google, have a Gmail account. And so you, with Gmail, you actually get a free AdWords account. AdWords is the advertising platform for Google. And they have a tool inside of it called Keyword Planner Tool. And this is how I understand what people are searching off of Amazon. Because 40% of product searches happen on Amazon today. 40% is happening somewhere else. And Google has a monopoly on search. No one's using Ask Jeeves. Nobody's using Yahoo. A couple of people maybe are, are using Bing. But majority of the people are using Google. So I use Google to come up with keywords and see are people searching this. And just a, another little gem to throw into this is I use Amazon's search at the top in order to start making Jenga pieces. I don't know. Or post-it notes. If you type in post-it into Amazon search, into the search box at the top, Amazon will start giving you uh, relevant terms that other people are searching. And it also is part of this validation process. It's part of saying, okay, people are searching for this. This is a problem, and you just need to take the initiative to solve the problem. So why do we want to validate? I think it's self-explanatory, but you're getting the answers to your questions. You do not want to guess in business, but you also don't want to just come out with a, a, a product and push it on customers. You want to make it, you want to pull it. You want to pull the, you want to make sure that people are telling you what they want to buy and you're solving the problem. And people, you do that through reviews, you can do that through keyword research, but these are some of the things that I'm doing in my daily grind that I'm sharing with you today. So before we get into execution, why don't we stop there and see if people have some questions uh, that I can answer. Yeah. So we have um, uh, Joe is wondering how to protect uh, his brand uh, from Amazon as a competitor. Well, you want to build a brand. I think that's partly the protection. You build a brand where you own the supply chain. You're building a brand. So you want to make sure you trademark your name. You want to make sure you have brand registry. These are things you should be doing right away to make sure that nobody, like once you already have good traction with your product and people love the product, Amazon can't really take that from you. So the only thing you can do is build a brand, right? Build a moat around it where, like, again, we're going after solving a problem. If you're making a garlic press today, I'm telling you right now, there's not a lot of protection I can tell you. There's so many people making it. And Amazon surely sees this data on the back end. And if it's a basic item, they're going to move into it. In fact, Stubana, we wrote a whole blog post. If you actually went to our blog and search uh, Amazon Basics, you'll see we did a whole analysis on Amazon Basics. It's actually fascinating what's happening with Basics. But they're moving very quickly into their own branded product. And they're kind of like a sleeping giant. But I'm telling you right now, Amazon will never work as hard as you for a product. It's really important to know that. Like, they are Goliath, but they're never going to have the same kind of hustle that you do. You need to make sure you're working smarter. Great. Um, I have one from, I don't have a name for the person here, but I'm sure you'll know when you hear it. Um, at what level in sales, uh, number of sales, would you suggest that uh, we start to use Scubana? So that's a great question, actually. So uh, for Stubana, we are really focused on medium to high volume sellers. This was built for larger sellers based around my needs because I'm doing 60,000 orders a month. And so I couldn't find a software out there that actually unified everything to give me intelligence to automate my business. I think I forgot to mention I have two employees with an eight-figure business, which is unheard of. And I attribute that to actually a good tech stack, a good software to make it happen. So if you're not doing over a million right now, there's a lot of entry-level softwares out there on the market uh, that are that could get you through this period to help you grow. But we, once you're ready to take your business to the next level and and, and uh, hit escape of velocity, uh, Stubana is ready for you and waiting. Now, Excelco, 
just to speak about Excel, because they're a great uh, customer support platform, and I'm all about efficiency. You can start using Excel right away because if you're start, if you and we'll talk more about this as we progress. But if you want to sell in multiple channels, it gets very hard and tedious to manage all those tickets and to do it smartly. So, and I, I was just talking the other day at a conference. The key is your tech stack and what you're using for your business today defines your success. You can use technology to work smarter than your competitors. It's a competitive advantage that nobody is even pointing to. So I have one here from Jacob. Um, Jacob is wondering, uh, should you as an Amazon seller be advertising on AdWords as the conversion rates on Amazon drops? So you can def So here's the thing. You can definitely be using Google AdWords to drive traffic to your Amazon listings. Not a lot of people are actually doing that right now. A lot of people are using sponsored ads uh, on, on Amazon. Genius for Amazon to launch that, to literally make people pay to drive traffic to the listing to buy from their own company. I mean, wow. So you could be using Google AdWords for that. But the other piece is you could be actually building your own shopping cart that allows you to actually own the customer at the end of the day and drive traffic to your own site. And you don't have to give up 15% to Amazon. So you actually have more spend than, uh, than you would have thought. So we'll talk about shopping carts in just a little bit. But I think it's important is if you're building a brand, you need to make sure you're building a brand that's sustainable, that's not just on Amazon. I, and I, just one last note, I think it's really important that you can start on Amazon, but you never want to finish on Amazon. You want It's easy to sell across channels. It's very easy. I was just doing consulting work for a company yesterday, and they're like, wait a minute, so you just post your product to Walmart, and people just come, and they don't have a sponsored product platform or any advertising? I was like, no, they do the advertising for you. And Jet.com, yeah, Jet.com is doing a tremendous amount of advertising for their clients. Literally, they're spending $150 to make $100 right now. And so why not let them use your brand and get in front of a wider audience? Uh, I'll just give you one last one before you go on to the, the next stage. Okay. Um, it's a slightly different topic on feedback. So um, Emil, I hope I've pronounced that properly too, <laughs> um, is wondering how important are reviews to launching products and how is it possible to generate enough reviews to launch without uh, buying uh, honest reviews? All right, so this is a controversial topic. First of all, I think reviews are great for social proof. So product reviews are very important for social proof. If you are building a product and you only have four stars and your competitor has 150, it's likely people are going to buy, it's just common sense, people are going to buy the one that has 150 reviews if it's above four stars. So you can generate reviews. Now, I think Amazon is starting to crack down on this tremendously. There's a really interesting website I just recently learned about. It was called Meta Reviews or Review Meta. I think it's Meta Reviews. And you can put in a link of a product into this search and it'll tell you, what percentage of the reviews are fake or have been paid for. I think that's really, really tremendous to know. Uh, and I think Amazon is going to start gaining wind of all this. There's a lot of stuff in the news right now about reviews and fake reviews on Amazon. And Amazon wants to protect their reputation. I think that's very, very important. So there's a lot of review softwares out there, but I can't promise that Amazon's not going to crack down on this uh, very soon. So you have someone like a review, uh, I think it's called AMZ Tracker, you can check out. You can check out Honest Few, they do some curated reviews. There's a lot of review companies out there they can look at. But I think Amazon's going to start cracking down more heavily on this. They actually just changed their policy where in order to leave a review, you, will, you have had to spend $50 on the platform. It used to be five. So there's changes that are on the horizon right now, and you need to be able to navigate them. Great, thank you, Chad. Uh, I think that's so, um, Okay, so for sourcing, I want to go back to the question from Joe that was asked earlier is how do you find a trustworthy supplier? The only way to do that is you, you I mean, I think Alibaba is a great resource and you go to Alibaba and uh, you essentially start finding people that maybe make something similar to you or similar to what you want to make. So if you want to make a pet carrier, look up pet carrier, see what's out there, but maybe you want to make some improvis uh, improvised change, iterate on it. So Alibaba is a great place to start. Once you understand all the suppliers, I would make a spreadsheet. On the top is all the, say, uh, the companies, 
on the left is all the product, and you put their price, their lead time, build a spreadsheet, and start seeing are they in the ballpark of what you want to manufacture, put, their, put the name of the person, and then you start Skyping with them. I think Skype is extremely important because you can now start getting details like if you ask the supplier, who else do you manufacture for? That's a great question to ask because now you can see are they trustworthy? Are they going to give you that, that, that tip or are they going to uh, not tell you? And I think that's an important question. Or you go to China and you shake hands with, like in China or Asia in general, like a handshake is very important. Exchanging business cards with two hands is extremely important. And so that is valued and you can go to their warehouse or to their factory and see and make sure that they're a real company. You want, and, or you can ask, ask them on Skype to give you a tour of their factory. These are all important things that you learn in the school of hustle, of life, versus not in school. These are things I've learned on the ground. Most importantly is having a beer with the factory manager. Always have a beer, go out, have, go to karaoke with them, have a good time, and that connection is a fantastic connection that keeps your relationship sustained over time. So Alibaba is a great resource for importing. Uh, you know, it's funny, there's not one place online today where you can actually understand who are the factories in the United States. So there's a company called ThomasNet, but I can spend two days on that site and still not find a good factory. I, I literally, I'm just confused every time I go on that site. So right away, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, that's a problem. Why doesn't anybody have a US factory database that's like Alibaba to support US factories? Because US is coming, manufacturing is starting to come back to the United States for furniture and apparel. Uh, the last piece is that there's these competitive intelligence reports from Bill of Ladings that you can be looking at online that give you more data of what's coming into the United States. So, uh, another thing while we're talking about competitive intelligence is Excelco allows you to actually see what your com competition is doing. They have a repricer, not just a, a mail uh, customer support uh, software. So you can actually see and watch your top competitors, what they're doing, and then you can react in real time to your own products. Or you can target your own your, your competitors as well. So there's a lot of things you can be doing on the platform on a price level to make sure that you're moving the needle on, uh, on your business. So Another interesting thing that I do, so when, when we st first started Crucial, uh, I wasn't sure how to ship. And so we started shipping using like priority mail for like an eight ounce box. And I was trying to understand like there's got to be a better way. And so I started actually shopping online and learning best practices, not just of competitors, but also people that are actually doing it correctly. So. For me, I actually don't walk into retail stores anymore. I shop online all the time so I can see what are these cool companies doing, how are they shipping. So the first thing I look at on a shipping box is the shipping label. And I'll take that address, I'll put it into Google and see, okay, are they using a third-party warehouse or are they shipping out of their own warehouse? Or did they use FedEx or are they using FedEx Smart Post or are they using UPS uh, Short Post or DHL e-commerce? So then I open the box and see what the unboxing experience is like. These are like things that I think are common sense, but a lot of people just don't think to do this. And it's a great way to get competitive intelligence and see what's happening. So let's just do an example. I bought Bose headphones, literally two ounces. Bose ships it to me in a two pound UPS bag with bubble wrap. Now, they spend a lot of money on shipping this UPS ground and First of all, it shouldn't have been two pounds, but also there's a lot better ways to actually ship this product that they're not aware of. And that's why a lot of these other companies are disrupting these incumbents that have traditionally owned these markets for long periods of time. There's a massive shift happening right now in buying behavior, and right now is the time to actually exploit that. I'll go through this slide and then we'll open up to questions again and again, make this interactive. I think the most important thing here is some people on the phone have no product or maybe they have a product idea but they're like, wait a minute, I don't have cash. A lot of people point to VCs uh, or you know, they really um, praise themselves when they raise money from a, a venture capital firm or an angel firm uh, or seed investors and, or you know, I like to pat myself on the back so I built a self-funded business. More risk, more reward. 
But one thing that nobody is talking about is Kickstarter. I think it's a great way to validate your idea and get cash in the door before you actually invest more, he more heavily in that product. So you literally can create a Kickstarter campaign, launch your product, see if there's a demand. You get the capital up front, which validates the idea, gives you cash, infuses it, and you get to keep your equity. Because once you actually own equity in your own brand, you understand the power of equity and how important your brand is. One of the things I was doing back in the day was I was reselling product and it seemed like a musical chair uh, event, right? Amazon just swaps me out of the buy box, I lose share, maybe I'll have 20, 25% share, but at any point in time, you can just not be on Amazon. So I really want to own my brand, but also understand that perhaps there's a lot more value in owning the supply chain, owning the brand, and gives you the flexibility to have an exit uh, at another period or another time or another date. So with that, let's open up the questions and we're moving to the next piece of the presentation, which is execution. Is there any questions on what I've covered? Um, I have one on uh, asking, what was your biggest challenge in your first two years of selling online? Okay, uh, first challenge I would say was running a warehouse. So running a warehouse is incredibly challenging. And um, I, especially in the metropolitan area, which is where I was living, I had, a, I had a warehouse in Harlem, and trying to manage those employees was incredibly difficult and enormously more challenging than I ever imagined. And uh, with the growth came, I was bursting through the seams and didn't have a, a proper, efficient process to my warehouse. And I actually decided to outsource my warehouse to a third-party logistics company, which now runs my entire warehouse operation. And if you email me, I'll be happy to make you an introduction. Uh, so they run my entire warehouse, and it's freed up my time to focus on building my business, my core competency. I think that's the really important one is getting the foundation for your own business. And two, uh, I think the challenge was on the software side, which is why I started Scubano. So there's a lot of softwares out there today that literally you get, on, you, you get into a car and you realize the car has no engine. But they sell you on the software and they lock you into a contract and you just can't move. So for me, I really was like, wait a minute, there's a better way. Why do I have to duct tape it all together and I didn't have real-time inventory management at the time. Like, it was just a nightmare. And I also, so that's how I started Subana to automate the operations of my business. So those are the two really big things. You want to build a house. You need to have a right foundation. And when you're building a warehouse, <laughs> make sure, yes, it's on the right foundation, but make sure you're actually implementing best practices for warehouse management and control. Like, make sure everything has a SKU number, a unique identifier. Make sure everything has a row, a bay, an aisle. These are small things that I didn't know, but I learned through just the grind. Great. Um, I have a couple more uh, on shipping. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jim is wondering what is the top three best ways to ship small items? <laughs> so, uh, there's a, so if it's a small item, and you're doing it, and it's less than 13 ounces, you can ship first class mail, USPS. But there's a lot of these, what they call, um, uh, they do the, so the company like UPS Mail Innovations or DHL Commerce, what they do is, instead of uh, having USPS do the entire delivery for you, picking up your package and doing the delivery, you hand off all your packages to DHL e-commerce or UPS Mail Innovations, and they will pick up your packages and use their own logistics network to bring your goods to a post office where the post office does the final delivery. And you save a lot of money. It's far more efficient. And um, the next thing I want to tell you about is that if you actually outsource your business to a third-party logistics company, an outsourced warehouse, you have the benefit of utilizing the rates of the group. It's kind of like a co-op almost of shipping rates. And I look at that as a core competency or a competitive advantage. So it's, use that as a competitive advantage to get better rates than anyone else in the marketplace because you have this group co-op going on at the outsourced warehouse. So these are benefits of outsourcing the warehouse. I'm a firm believer in outsourcing things that you're not good at or that you suck at. Great. Uh, I think that actually answers Eli's question as well. Uh, Eli, let me know if not. Um, 
uh, Eli's uh, shipping 30 to 50 boxes per day with USPS uh, priority. Um, they fulfill themselves and it's 10 to $20 average per box. Um, he's wondering wow. who to ship with instead. So I think uh, your suggestions there probably answer that. If it's over a pound, you can check out uh, FedEx Smart Post or UPS Shore Post. Those are other options for things that are over a pound. And then, of course, outsource in the warehouse. So the benefit of going direct to consumer, and there's tons of benefits, but the result of actually doing this is that you have a lot higher profit margins. You own your brand. It's trademarked. There's a real tangible value in your product, especially if you're not just selling on Amazon, which we'll talk about. If you're just selling on Amazon and you want to create wealth for generations and you're going to sell your business today, the multiple that an investor is going to give you is going to be tremendously low. And I like to ask people this question, would you ever invest your life savings into one stock? And everyone says no. Of course not. Why would I invest, why would I invest all my life savings in one stock with one customer? So why would you invest your life savings into one channel? Amazon is just a channel. It's not a business. So make sure you're building a business across multiple channels. So for me, I sell on like 30 or 40 channels, but to name a few, Amazon, eBay, Jet.com, Walmart, Overstock, Wayfair, Newegg, Price Falls. I can go on and on. And building your own shopping cart. I look at selling online like playing Monopoly. You need to make sure you're on every piece of the board to win. You want to own the railroad. You want to own the energy company, the electrical company, and you want to own Park Ave. So it's no, as long as you have the right software in place to make it happen, it's no sweat off your back to get on to all these other channels. It's easy. You create a listing, and that's it. You let the orders flow into an amazing operational software <laughs> with one flip integrations to all of them. So Stupana disrupts the industry because we take out the middlemen. All these fragmented softwares, we literally streamline the entire process. Everything after the checkout comes into Stubana to run and operate and automate your business. We are the central nervous system of your business. Excelco has an integration with one click, no customizations, no setup fees, no BS. All the order details from all your orders flow into Excelco. So now you can be responding to all your marketplaces from one platform with all the details in one place. To me, it's a groundbreaking integration and goes back to what I was saying before is your tech stack will define your success in e-commerce. It's super important. And people are like, oh wait, chat, selling offline or off Amazon is so hard. Why do it? And it's not so hard. You just have to have a technology in place to make it happen. So like I said, Excelco for all your multi-channel support tickets, can responses, this frees up the time of your employees to repurpose them to focus on higher value activities. So you focus, repurpose, you want to make sure that you're extracting the most amount of uh, talent from your employees and having them stuck answering questions on, on, these, on, these, uh, on each platform is very, very difficult. But with Excel code, it makes it a lot easier. Is there any, any questions before I keep going? Uh, we do have a couple. Um, okay. Uh, while, while, while you're reading the question, this morning, I want to add one thing. People are always ask me, Chad, what are the next two or three marketplaces I should be on? So Amazon is great. And by the way, make sure you're international. Amazon Canada is fantastic, but I think most people don't realize how big Amazon Germany is. Amazon Germany is bigger than Amazon UK, and there's a lot less competition. So in order to succeed in business, you have to do things others aren't willing to do. Here's an aha moment. Translate your listings. Don't use a robot. Translate the listings into Germany with a real live translator, and you will see your business take off in Germany. So Amazon. I think building your own shopping cart is super important. I'll talk about that coming up. And then Walmart and Jet.com are the next two you should get onto right away. Okay, so there's there's one person tuning in wondering where he can get one of your Scubana t-shirts. <laughs> ah, just just email me. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll get uh, Chad's email at the end, so you can you can ask him that then. We also have hats. Ah, I could use one of those. 
Um, so we have one from Michaela. Um, so Amazon insists on having returns, uh, returns warehouse for where you sell. For instance, we're in the UK, we sell to the US. If a customer from the US wants to return to us, we have to cover the postage costs. Uh, do you know any uh, websites for places in the US that would offer this uh, service to Michaela? So return, return or reverse logistics, absolutely. Email me, I'll give you a couple of different names to reach out to. Uh, but a 3PL, a third party warehouse could do this and accept returns for you and then batch them and then send them back to, your, to uh, the UK for you. Great. Um, so we, again, uh, Michaela will give you Chad's email at the end. So Dan is wondering, uh, what are your feelings about a hosted storefront or cart-like system uh, like uh, Shopify or Magento? Yeah, so actually let's get right into that. So I'm going to address that in one second. So A, there's life off Amazon. I used to be 100% on Amazon diversified my business, now it's about 50% of my business. So people are like, wait, do people shop off Amazon? The answer is yes, and you need to make it happen. It's very easy to do, and building, like my own shopping cart is actually the second biggest channel I sell on. So there is life off Amazon, and you need to diversify. So uh, let's get into shopping carts. I think that's a great question. So I traditionally built my site on Magento, which is a a big upfront fee it allows you to have a lot more customization, but it's self-hosted. And I decided, and this goes the same with, with any technology that you're going on, I'm a big fan of SaaS because you don't have to manage all the bugs and all the other things that happen. So for me, I have a strong preference over uh, open source hosted to a SaaS model. It's turnkey, it's quick, there's zero maintenance, and I can focus on building my business. So Shopify and BigCommerce are the two biggies that I would suggest you check you check out and, and uh, do your research, see what's different about them, what they offer, and come up with your and like get them on the phone, and be like, hey, BigCommerce, why should we go with you instead of Shopify? Uh, hey, Shopify, why should we go with you over BigCommerce and weigh the cost, the benefits or the, the disadvantages? But I would tell you that right now, I think Magento, specifically the fact that they were uh, acquired. Uh, by a private equity company, and I used to have to host my own site and spend a lot of money on bug fixes. If you have a lot of customizations, it's fantastic, but it's overblown if you don't have a lot of customizations to make. And then, of course, the next step would be a licensed shopping cart, which is very high-end, demandware, IBM, Magento, uh, extremely high cost, but if you're at that level, it offers you a ton of flexibility and customizations. Is there is there questions on that are coming in? Uh, yeah. So we have one asking, uh, would you recommend using FBA to fulfill non Amazon Amazon orders? So if you don't have a warehouse today and you're just Amazon FBA, you can do multi-channel fulfillment and you can do it through Scubana. You can do it internationally and domestically. Amazon recently changed their policy. They used to allow you to use a generic box to ship your product off channel. But now that Jet and Walmart have really picked up steam, Amazon reverted their policy and now you can only ship using Amazon box. So it's not in line with the terms of service for a lot of the marketplaces to use multi-channel fulfillment anymore. Because why would someone shop on Walmart but receive an Amazon box? So something that you need to read and look up before you do it, but it gives you, it allows you to, to essentially use Amazon as a warehouse uh, and get traction and validate the fact that you're going to build an off-channel presence using multi-channel fulfillment. I think it's a great starting point, but I prefer you can save a lot more money by doing a pick and pack with your either your own warehouse or uh, with an outsourced warehouse. Great, thanks, Chad. I think you're good to move on. I'll save some questions for the end. Okay. So once you build your shopping cart, uh, let me take a drink in one second. Once you build the shopping cart, it's not that you build it and they will come. It actually takes some work, but the, the uh, berry is worth the squeeze. So the first thing I would suggest is picking the proper social media strategy. So you have to go where the eyeballs are going and where people's eyeballs are going typically follows with their wallet. So 
for me, selling vacuum filters, like nobody wants to see a dirty vacuum filter on Pinterest. So, but Pinterest, people love coffee. On Twitter, people are complaining about their vacuums all the time, and it creates a great forum for me to go and approach those customers to helping them solve a problem. Their problem, their vacuum sucks, literally, or, or it actually just doesn't pick up anything on the floor. And so we're there to help them through the process. Or Facebook. Facebook uh, is extremely important. Eyeballs are going there. And if you have a product that lends itself well to Facebook, Facebook, you should be there. But make sure you're not just sending deals. All the time, I'm seeing people just literally getting coupon codes on their website. That's not the way to win. That's not how Facebook works. Have you ever walked into an elevator and everybody is on their phone and everyone's on Facebook? They don't want to see a promo code. They want to see something that takes them out of reality, that makes them laugh, that makes them giggle, that's interesting or fascinating to them, intriguing. That's what you want to be doing on Facebook. Uh, there's a book that I'm going to talk about just after the slide. It's uh, Jab, Jab, Right Hook by Gary Vaynerchuk. And he talks about just that. You want to jab as much as possible. And then once you have their attention, then you go for the right hook. Then you say, hey, by the way, we might, we make this product. It'd be great for you. Or another thing you can be doing on Facebook, not to spend too much time on Facebook, but you can go into these uh, Facebook groups. For example, what I realize is that there's a lot of allergy sufferers, but there's also a lot of baby um, mothers that are nesting, that are bringing a child into this world and want to make sure their floors are clean. So you can get involved into these Facebook groups and promote your product through these Facebook groups and get the word out and give the Facebook group either a commission uh, using uh, a share of sale like I have listed here, affiliate marketing, so you can give them 8% of the sale or 7%, log into share of sale or commission junction and see what your, what your competition is offering. And that's a super, super important thing to do uh, where you offer them something you want to give to get. And the other thing you could be doing is also getting your product on Google AdWords or product listing ads, which allows you to get traction on the people that aren't going to Amazon first Maybe starting their search on Google. So you want to start with Google and then move into Bing and Yahoo. There's also a lot of guerrilla marketing you could be doing on forums. There's a lot of talk and chatter about every topic that you can imagine is Googleable. So forums, blog comments, and YouTube videos, people don't realize that YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. And it has so many visitors and ranks extremely well, and it's all organic. So here's some, here's some books. Uh, one of them is actually my book, Cheaper, Easier, Direct, which is no surprise on Amazon. Highly suggest you check it out, of course. Uh, virtual Freedom is a great thing I've used for outsourcing uh, employees and figuring out processes and ways to automate my business. I mentioned Jab, Jab, Right Hook with Gary Vaynerchuk. Fantastic book. Never Eat Alone really speaks to the idea of uh, karma and reciprocity and giving, giving to get. And then delivering happiness is all about customer delight and how I based a lot of my customer delight policies uh, based on Zappos, which is written by Tony Shea. Is there, is there questions? We have one here for, <clears throat> uh, if starting on Amazon, is it possible to get on Walmart? Uh, they do ask for sales. They do ask for sales and we, like, we can help you get expedited on Walmart at Skubana because we're an integrated partner, uh, but they do have certain requirements that pre-qualify those and get them ahead versus others, and one of those is doing over a million dollars in business. Um, uh, I just want to quickly mention just some resources here, and then we'll, we'll open up to, to, uh, to Q&A some blogs that I'm always looking at. I think the most important one is, for marketing purposes is a blog called Quick Sprout. Check out Quick Sprout, this guy Neil Patel really shares a ton of information. I've learned a lot. For me, it's all about where I can be learning and where the value is coming from. Uh, also, for outsourcing, you can see there's a link here for Upwork.com. Fiverr allows you to accomplish jobs with, with $5. Logo Tournament is actually how I initially developed the Crucial Logo. And um, I use some productivity apps. One of them I think is really important to note is Trello. Trello allows me to manage all my employees and streamline them in one place. Um, I use Boomerang for Zero Inbox, Feedly for all my blogs that I subscribe to. I'm available, we're all available, uh, Twitter, uh, there's my LinkedIn profile, you can email me. But I think now is the time that we can open it up to Q&A. Great. 
so I saved a couple of product questions just to the end uh, so that we weren't interrupting in between. So there's one for you, Chad, uh, from Marco on Scubana. Um, he wants to know how you're using Scubana to automate your business. Ah, so all the orders flow into Scubana. You can fulfill them any way you want, including FBA. We juggle all the inventory. None of it's manual, but we actually algorithmically will create purchase orders awaiting your approval. We'll tell you how many to send to Amazon FBA, when you're going to run out of stock. On top of that, with all the data being unified in one platform, you actually have uh, profitability across every SKU, across every marketplace for a time period, with all the hidden fees from Amazon FBA. So we've set up a system that allows you to, if you're using virtual assistants today, you don't need to use as many. But using technology to do what it does best, which is to scan and understand and make recommendations, so it takes the thinking out, out of it. You don't have to think about it anymore. You let Stubana do what it's supposed to do, and then you just approve it. So we'll never send out a purchase order without your approval, but it creates a PO at the right time, at the right place, with the right quantity with a bow on top. Do I want to actually order this? Do I want to actually send it to Amazon? Well, let's see. Let's go to profitability and see how much you're making on that product, you can sort your SKUs and rank them against each other and see where you're losing money, where are there are holes in your bucket with every hidden fees from Amazon. And it's it's truly eye-opening what we've learned. So two employees, everything else is automated with the software. And then of course all those orders flow into Excel Co automatically and so we streamline the customer support process and I have people in the Philippines doing the customer support through Excelco with canned responses, it's, it's, a, it's impressive what we've been able to build and, and, and collaborate on. Great. I think that uh, answers uh, Luke's question as well. Let me know, Luke, if that doesn't. Um, so uh, I just wanted to put one in. There's one from Rebecca asking about how Excelco, Excelco Fusion cuts um, response times. Um, I'll take that one, Chad, so they probably know more. Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, uh, Rebecca, by centralizing all of your marketplace queries into the one place, that cuts your responses in half just uh, by not having to log into multiple places, your web store, um, mm -hmm. even your social channels, that's all integrated into the one uh, dashboard. Um, but as well as that, we have kind of automated uh, tools such as templates and smart tags. Um, so smart tags will let you personalize responses. Even if they're automated, uh, you still get to have that kind of personal brand uh, um, personal touch on it so they can cut your response times again in half by sending out uh, answers to common queries that your customers will ask so you can kind of target uh, specific uh, questions and respond a lot faster um, and then I have one aside from that which is So this is from Michaela. For a business that sells a lot of products, it's hard to get out there and noticed. Um, we don't sell the one thing. We have uh, 5,000 SKUs. Uh, what would you suggest to a company that struggles to target potential buyers when we have so much to offer? So you have 5,000 SKUs. I'd, I'd ask you firstly, are you private label? Or are you reselling those SKUs? I think that there's an important uh, diff difference there to analyze. So that's my first question. Uh, Michaela, feel free to email me or, or uh, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to, to go into some detail on it. I need to understand a little bit more about your business. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so Michaela, if you want to drop a question in there um, or get back to Chad individually at the end. Um, so here's a question from Joe. Um, Wondering, does Scubana only work in the USA? So we work in the USA if you're printing shipping labels, but if you have it either a free PL internationally, an outsourced warehouse, or you're doing multi-channel fulfillment and you're doing FBA, we support it. But at the moment, you can print a shipping label through Scubana internationally. Okay. It's coming, but it's not. We're not there yet. Uh, Curtis is looking a bit for pricing on Scubana, um, but. He can, I presume he can get in touch with you at the end or? Yeah, just shoot me an email. Like for us, we don't, we, we customize pricing for each individual seller so that it works. It's more of a partnership than a vendor-seller relationship. So we customize pricing uh, 
based on budget, based on your needs, your users. But our minimum pay to play up front is $999. So if you're not at that level, that's fine. I'm happy to help. No worries. But essentially, Subana is built for the medium to high volume selling community. Great. And I think we've got uh, one last one. I think is all we have time for. Um, so it's uh, we're wondering if FBA generates more sales when you sell on Amazon. Um, uh, yeah, it's again, you're not relevant if you're not FBA. You you need to make sure your products are FBA. That's why I believe drop shipping is dying because you need to take ownership of that product and get it to, into Amazon's facilities to be relevant to be to get exposure. So if you're not FBA, you're not relevant. It'll increase your order volume at least 40%, I think, by getting your products into FBA alone. So it's a great question. I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. But the last thing I want to say is make sure you're analyzing your life and your business. Look for vulnerabilities in those areas and try to execute on them with creating a product that solves a problem. Thank you so much for joining. Email me. Email Lisa. Thank you. Thanks a million, everyone. Take care and best of luck with all of your uh, product strategies. Bye now.